Well, welcome to those of you who are joining us online and also those of you who are meeting together here at Central Campus, along with the rest of you who are meeting at one of our other campuses um, up in Airdrie, uh, over in Bearspaw, down at Bridgeland, and South Calgary. I'm going to invite you to turn in your Bibles to Revelation 13. Have you ever wondered why it is so difficult to remain faithful and obedient to Jesus Christ? Why as Christians we pursue things that we know aren't worth pursuing? Or why we do things that we know that one day we're going to regret? Well, Revelation 13 gives us one of the key reasons, and that is we have a spiritual enemy called Satan who seeks to keep us from being faithful followers of Jesus Christ. Now, you may recall from last time when we were into Revelation 12, God removed Satan from his permanent home in heaven because Satan did what we're all capable of doing, and that is he became proud. And he wanted to be worshipped rather than worship the God who created him. And as a result, Satan hates Jesus Christ. And since that time, his mission has been to keep the world from knowing Christ, from worshiping him and following him. And here in chapter 13, he goes after the people of God through two beasts, one from the sea, the other from the earth, often referred to today as the Antichrist and the false prophet. These two counterfeit superpowers are empowered by Satan and are also puppets of Satan in the sense they're assigned to carry out Satan's agenda. Now, in addition to the Antichrist and the false prophet, chapter 13 also introduces us to the mark of the beast and the well-known number 666, which Christians just love to speculate about. In fact, they have speculated about it for centuries, and they continue to do it today, which in my humble opinion is a royal waste of precious time that should be devoted to doing the mission that Christ has called us to. <clears throat> we'll carry on. Let's put aside all of the speculation and the series at least long enough to examine what this chapter is actually teaching about the two beasts and the mark of the beast. But before we do, I'm going to invite you uh, to stand with me as we dedicate this time to the Lord in prayer. Our Heavenly Father, our hearts grow uneasy as we read about the plans of the evil one and those he has charged to deceive us into false worship. I pray, O oh Lord, that you will help us to not only understand what you're teaching us in this chapter, but also that you will help us to know what it is you're saying to us today. I pray, Lord, that you will remove distractions and that you will focus our minds on what you want to say to us. For I pray it in the precious name of Jesus, the name that is above all names. Amen. You may be seated. Now, beginning in verse 1, John gives us a description of the first beast coming out of the sea. It says this, The dragon stood on the shore of the sea, and I saw a beast coming out of the sea. It had ten horns and seven heads with ten crowns on its horns, and on each head a blasphemous name. The beast I saw resembled a leopard, but had feet like those of a bear and a mouth like that of a lion. The dragon gave the beast his power and his throne and great authority. Now, first of all, the sea beast or the Antichrist 
will be a political leader who, according to verse 2, will receive his power and authority um, from Satan himself. You see, the devil typically promotes himself and advances his sinister agenda on earth through others. In the same way, Holy Spirit will influence us to follow the character, the way, um, and the life of Jesus Christ, so Satan and his minions will influence us to do the opposite. And here in our text, Satan empowers the sea beast to carry out his plans. Now, secondly, the sea beast represents a kingdom and a person. And both are evil and brutal. The beast represents a kingdom because the beast that John saw coming out of the sea had ten horns and seven heads with ten crowns on its, on its horns. Now, hundreds of years before John had these visions in Revelation, we read in Daniel chapter 7 that the prophet Daniel had a vision in which he too saw four beasts, a lion, a bear, and a leopard, and a fourth beast, which in Daniel's words was terrifying and frightening, very powerful, and it had ten horns. Now, does that sound familiar? You see, the beast that Daniel saw in his vision is the same beast that John saw hundreds of years later of the devil, of a devil-empowered kingdom and the terrifying leader of that kingdom rising from the sea being a culmination of the pride, the power, the cruelty, and the atrocities of these historic political kingdoms. And then thirdly, both beasts initially appear charming and wonderful. The Apostle John refers to these two henchmen of Satan as beasts because that is who they really are. They're beasts. They're evil counterfeits and deceivers, but they won't appear that way, at least not initially. No, they'll appear as the most amazing, brilliant, inspirational, and wise people on the planet. Speaking of the Antichrist, verse 3 tells us that the whole world was filled with wonder and followed the beast. Now, they will follow the Antichrist for a couple of reasons. The first is because he will have a, a, a captivating, charismatic personality with a powerful uh, speaking gift capable of swaying the masses. In Daniel chapter 7, verse 8, the prophet has a vision of a little horn that slowly becomes a mighty horn greater than all the other horns. That little horn is the Antichrist who starts out very slowly but over time begins to win the hearts of people everywhere and based on Revelation 17 verse 9 will eventually take complete control and authority over the ten horns which many believe will be a ten nation confederacy of world rulers. That is how the Antichrist will start out. However, after a period of time, he will suddenly change his tune and begin to break his promises. He'll begin to intimidate and demand worship and adoration. He will reveal his true nature and his motives, and he'll turn from being a, a, a peacemaker to being a peace taker. In other words, a destroyer of peace. Now, a second reason the whole world will be filled with the wonder and, uh, and follow the beast is because of what we read in verse 3. One of the heads of the beast seemed to have had a fatal wound, but the fatal wound had been healed. So what does that mean? Well, some believe that one of the kingdoms that was destroyed, which 
they believe are the nations representing the territory of the ancient Roman Empire, that th these nations will be revived into a new powerful empire. On the other hand, others believe the fatal wound refers to the Antichrist, who will be killed or his death will be faked, and then he will appear alive again. Now, to be clear, whether his death is faked or not, we do not know. However, most likely it will be a counterfeit because as we're going to see as we make our way through this chapter, several times we see that everything that Satan does is counterfeit. It's based on lies. Now, verse 4 tells us the Antichrist's real or fake resurrection will win him worldwide acclaim and worship. And the whole world will follow him except those whose names are written in the book of life or those who by faith are children of the king. And friends, church, I pray that everyone hears that your name is in the book of life. I really do. And then fourthly, we read in verse 5 that the sea beast is given permission by God to utter proud words and to blaspheme God and slander his name. He will attack everything true about God, God's nature, his character, and his people. And many who hear him will believe his lies, and as a result, they will hate and they will turn against the people of God and they will assault and persecute the people of God. And then fifthly, we read in verse 7 that God gives the beast permission to wage war against God's people and to conquer them. Now I want you to notice that several times in this chapter, references made that God gives permission to the beast to carry out his evil activities. Now, in a way, it's encouraging to, to remember that God is in control and that there is nothing that Satan can do, and especially nothing that Satan can do to us <laughs> without God's awareness and without God's permission. And yet, having said that, we don't know why God allows Satan to mess with us. Now, the scriptures do assure us that our God is good and that his purpose for allowing all that comes our way is also good. Like, for example, his purpose may be to test our faith in some way. And so we believe that whatever God allows to come our way is for our ultimate good and for his ultimate glory and that we can trust him in this. And we also know this, that God will only allow Satan to have his way for a time. Verse 5 says only for 42 months or 3.5 years. And therefore we're called upon in verse 10 to be faithful and to endure patiently because a day is coming when God will say that's enough I've, and put an end to Satan and his ways. And then sixthly, a day is coming when a great final leader, the Antichrist, will rule the world. In 1 John chapter 2, verse 18, the same apostle, by the way, who recorded Jesus' words and visions here in Revelation, this same apostle said this, Dear children, this is the last hour. And as you have heard that the Antichrist is coming, even now many Antichrists have come. And we're going to talk about that last sentence in a moment. In 2 Thessalonians 2, Paul describes the man of lawlessness, or the Antichrist, um, a description very similar to the one here in Revelation 13, beginning in verse 3, and we read this. Don't let anyone deceive you in any way, for that day will not come 
until the rebellion occurs and the man of lawlessness is revealed, the man doomed to destruction. He will oppose and will exalt himself over everything that is called God or is worshipped so that he sets himself up in God's temple proclaiming himself to be God. Make no mistake, in the same way that the spirit of the Antichrist existed in the first century in evil and ruthless leaders like Nero, the Caesar of Rome, for example, who many at that time believed was the Antichrist, and like the birth pangs that Jesus talks about, continues to become greater and more intense over the centuries, right up to our day, a time is coming when there will be a final world leader who is described here as the beast from the sea, who will set himself and his kingdom up against Christ and his kingdom. Now, we don't know when that will be, of course, but given the worldwide movement toward globalization, the talk about a new world order, the great economic reset, it does seem so much closer than it was even just a few years ago. Wouldn't you agree? Now, Satan isn't content doing his dirty work through just one beast. In verse 11, we read that he will raise up a second beast, a beast referred to as the false prophet in Revelation 19, verse 20. Look at verse 11. Then I saw a second beast coming out of the earth. It had two horns like a lamb, but it spoke like a dragon. It exercised all the authority of the first beast on its behalf and made the earth and its inhabitants worship the first beast whose fatal wound had been healed. Now, the false prophet is also under the authority of Satan, and his primary purpose is to make the people of the earth worship the first beast or the Antichrist. He has only two horns, it says, like a lamb, which indicates that he does not come as a conquering dictator, but will, have a, but will be a subtle deceiver who comes with meekness and gentleness. However, verse 11 says that he will speak like a dragon. In other words, he is Satan's mouthpiece, speaking Satan's deceiving lies, which will lure the world to worship the Antichrist. Now, the false prophet will deceive the world to worship the Antichrist primarily through signs and wonders. Look at verse 13. And it performed great signs, even causing fire to come down from heaven to the earth in full view of the people. Because of the signs, it was given power to perform on behalf of the first beast. It deceived the inhabitants of the earth. It ordered them to set up an image in order, in honor of the beast who was wounded by the sword and yet lived. Now, the pro false prophet will gain a lot of followers on the planet by drawing attention to the healing or the resurrection of the Antichrist. In addition, he will be empowered by Satan to perform miracles to get people to worship the, the sea beast, miracles not unlike those uh, that Elijah did. The Bible often warns us about those who seek to lead people astray by performing miracles. In Deuteronomy chapter 13, Moses told the Hebrew people that if a prophet comes along and does signs and wonders and gives the credit and the glory to himself or to some other god, this is a false prophet who needs to be removed from among the people and executed. God's pretty serious about this stuff. 
In 2 Thessalonians 2 verse 9, the Apostle Paul warned the believers that the coming of the lawless one or the Antichrist uh, will be in accordance with how Satan works. He will use all sorts of displays of power through signs and wonders that serve the lie. And then again in Matthew 24, verse 24, Jesus gave a similar warning. He said, for false messiahs and false prophets will appear and perform great signs and wonders to deceive. Now, this does not mean, of course, that we shouldn't be open to praying for healing and other miracles. It just means that everything must be done in accordance with the Word of God and that all the glory must always go to the Lord and not to someone else or to someone else's empire or someone else's bank account, which so often happens in this area. Now, what is most interesting is what we have here in the second beast or the false prophet is the completion of the unholy trinity. As I said, Satan is a master counterfeiter. And just as God is a trinity, Satan determines to be a trinity as well. Satan is the counterfeit of God the Father. The sea beast, or the Antichrist, is the counterfeit of Jesus, God the Son. And the false prophet is the counterfeit of God the Holy Spirit. You notice that the false prophet's mission is to point the world to who? The Antichrist. What's the Holy Spirit's primary focus? To point people to Christ. Together, Satan and his two beasts form the satanic, false, and unholy trinity. Now, verse 15 says, The second beast was given power to give breath to the image of the first beast so that the image could speak and cause all who refused to worship the image to be killed. Now, I'm not sure what this refers to in terms of this statue or idol that the false prophet insists be made, but this idol of the Antichrist will be able to move and talk. Now, people like to think that, well, modern technology will pull that off. But never forget that Satan is capable of doing things and has done things down through time that we still can't do today, like turning water to blood, which Pharaoh's demonically empowered magi mag magicians did back in Moses' day. You see, Satan loves to win over people's allegiance and get people to worship him by giving them power. And folks, this is going on all over the planet. We just don't realize it. Now in verse 16, we're told the false prophet maintains control by forcing everyone to receive a mark on the right hand or the forehead. Now the, the idea of a mark is a counterfeit idea as well. You may recall in Revelation 7, God's people were given their own mark or their own seal, which identified them as belonging to God. Well, once again, Satan, who I'm convinced has never had an original thought, he mimics God in this. Now, not taking the mark will have dire consequences. Verse 15 says, those refusing to take the mark will be executed. On the other hand, those who attempt to hide and avoid taking the mark, according to verse 15, 16, it says that no one will be able to buy or sell without it, which will ultimately result in starvation and death. You see, if you want to control the world, 
All you need to do is control the economy, the finances, and other necessities of life like food and water. Well, that is what the two beasts will do. They will maintain strict economic control over the world. Currency will be worthless as we know it. It will probably be replaced by something that can be controlled by those who are in power. Neither will food and other basic necessities of life be available for those who do not have the mark of the beast. Now let's face it. In an age where the mighty dollar rules so many people, it's not hard to believe that threats to our bank account, threats to their finances, could be the very thing that forces people into submission to the Antichrist. Now, there was a time that all of this sounded pretty far-fetched. However, let's be honest, unless you've been in a coma the last four to five years, what we read here in Revelation 13 no longer seems as far-fetched or as unthinkable as it would have seemed a decade or two ago. And so what does the number 666 mean? Well, I really don't know. But I'll tell you what I think it means. Not who it is, forget that, but what it means. Turn over to chapter 14, verse 1. This is what we read there. Then I looked, and there standing before me was the Lamb, standing on Mount Zion, and with him 144,000 who had his name and his father's name written on their foreheads. And I think that's a clue. God has his mark, and Satan has his mark. God's number is 777, which stands for perfection. God is perfect. His way is perfect. Now, verse 18 tells us that the number six represents man. Six is one short of perfection. Six is imperfect. 666 represents a man, and I believe it represents the sea beast, the Antichrist, who is determined to turn our affection and our worship away from Jesus to himself. Which leads me to the implications of our study here in chapter 13. I believe there are at least two things that the Lord wants to encourage us with and challenges with us with as well. First of all, we need to stay focused on Jesus and his promise that we are his. In the midst of an uncertain future, let us never forget that he will never leave us or forsake us. Here's the thing. When you read Revelation 12 and 13, you see Satan's evil agenda, and that can really create a spirit of fear and despair. But don't miss the overall point of these chapters. Yes, Satan is allowed for whatever reason to throw the absolute worst that he can conjure up at the woman, which is Israel, at the child, which is Jesus, and the woman's offspring, which are those of us who are followers of Jesus Christ. And yet, even though he has and will one day yet, through the two beasts, unleash all of his arsenal, everything he's got, it's not going to be enough. It's not going to be enough to defeat our Lord and the people of God. Every scheme of the devil has failed and will continue to fail. Because as Revelation 4 says, our God is the true God, the Lord God Almighty, who was and is and is to come. 
Whereas Revelation 17 verse 8 says about the devil that a day is coming when Satan, which once was, now is not and will go to his destruction. That's his future, folks. You know, a few days ago, I I heard a podcaster say something to this effect. He said, one thing I've noticed about a number of preachers and teachers on television and content creators on social media who focus primarily on end times is they love to grab people's attention. And he said, he's convinced it's to get followers, it's to get finances. And he says, they grab people's attention by always warning people about all that's wrong in the world, the terrible times that we're living in, the corruption, the woke agenda in politics and industry, the evil global elites, the sinister agenda of China and Russia, the possibility of World War III, and on and on we can go. And he says, it's good to be informed and aware of these issues, absolutely. But what I've noticed, he says, about so many of these Christian voices is that they only point you to the storms. They they don't point you to the one who's able to quiet the storms. Listen, what if the economy tanks? What if World War III happens? What if our way of life implodes as we know it? What if we lose it all? What does that change about our mission and focus as Christians while we wait for Jesus to return? Nothing. Let me remind you that no matter what happens, Jesus is Lord and King. He, He, He is our treasure and is totally trustworthy even in times of storm. People can hurt us, they can make us suffer, they can take our life but they can't take our faith in Christ. They can't take away that we are his. And they can't take us out of his hand. There are many reasons to fear, but Jesus commanded us not to fear, but instead to focus on him instead. Yes, stay informed and prepare for the worst, but don't lose hope and don't give in to fear. Preach and point people to Jesus right to the end because people's eternity depends on it, friends. So church, stay focused on Christ and be encouraged both now and in the future. God is still God and Satan is not. Keep that in mind as you move into the future. Don't forget that one day God will put an end to Satan and to his sinister ways. In fact, 2 Thessalonians 2.8, uh, Paul says that when Jesus comes again, just get this, he will overthrow and destroy the lawless one. In other words, the Antichrist. How? With the breath of of his mouth. That's the God we serve, friends. And so it is written, so it shall be done. And then secondly, a word of challenge. That was a word of encouragement. Now we get to the good part the hard part because it's not going to be easy to receive I'm telling you right up front and the reason it's not going to be easy to receive is because it's going to expose what's really going on in our heart we 
We need to decide now who we will worship and surrender our lives to completely. Not sometime in the future. Now. Who will our God and Lord be? I mean, really be. I mean, in light of Revelation 13, whose mark will we take? See, here in Revelation 12 and 13, Jesus pulls back the spiritual curtain and he says, my child, make no mistake, there's a spiritual battle going on, a battle between good and evil, between heaven and hell, between God and Satan, and it matters more than you can imagine. He's saying to you and to me, be careful to guard your mind and your heart because the enemy is after your soul. And if he can't get your soul, he's after your allegiance and your loyalty to Jesus Christ. Satan is on a mission to neutralizing your influence. He's on a mission to taking you out of the action one way or another through discouragement, through disappointment, through apathy, through misguided priorities, and especially, note this, through worshiping counterfeit gods. Please hear me, church. Yes, one day, there will be a final antichrist who will force those who are alive at that time to make a decision about who they will worship and whether they will take the mark or not. But God is warning us not to wait until then to decide who we will give our lives to, who we will worship, and whose mark we will take now. He's warning us to be alert to the spirit of the Antichrist today, not sometime in the future, but today. The spirit of the Antichrist is anything which takes our focus off of Jesus and his calling in our lives and puts it on something else. The spirit of the Antichrist is idolatry. It is the worship of false gods. And in 1 Corinthians 10, the Apostle Paul said, Therefore, my dear friends, flee from idolatry. You know, there is a reason why the first commandment that God gave is, You shall have no other gods before me. There is no greater sin than the sin of idolatry, the sin of putting anything ahead of God in your life. And that includes putting yourself ahead of God. Now, when I think of the sin of idolatry, I think of Isaiah, who God called to warn his people about idolatry. Isaiah 6 says, that King Uzziah died. King Uzziah ruled for a period of 52 years. He was an amazing leader, a master builder, and a military and economic genius. Through his leadership, the economy was booming. Recession wasn't part of their vocabulary. But then this magnificent leader and king in whom they had come to trust suddenly died. And you can be sure that his death would have rocked the Jewish people of his day. I'm sure many would have been nervous about the future, about the economy, about their jobs, about their way of life, and especially their security as a nation. Very much like many people today are uncertain about many of these things as well. You know, sometimes it isn't until our world caves in that we wake up spiritually and our attention shifts from the temporary to the eternal, from the earthly king to our heavenly king. 
Now at that time, the people were far from God. And so God, out of love for the spiritual state of his people and his deep desire that they not fall under judgment, he called Isaiah to go and to warn them. Now make no mistake, these people were religious. I mean, they were temple-going people. The problem is they were living like God didn't exist. They took God for granted and they ignored him. And folks, make no mistake, when we say we believe in God but live like he doesn't exist, when we ignore him, when we take him for granted, when the highest affections, our highest affections are, are directed at something or someone other than God, he is deeply grieved. And he won't let that go on very long. He will do something to get our attention because he loves us too much to see us continue on the path that we're on and he will try to give us a wake-up call. And so Isaiah goes forth as God's messenger to the people, warning them that they are in a dangerous place with God. And if I were to summarize what Isaiah says to the people then and paraphrase what the Lord told him to say in our 21st century context, it would be something like this. You say that there is no one greater than the Lord in your life, but you've whittled God down to a comfortable size. You want just enough of him to be blessed, but not enough of him to let him change your life and to empower you to accomplish the mission that you've been called to. You know about him. The problem is you just don't know him. In chapters 58 and 59, Isaiah says, you are very religious. You faithfully perform all the rituals, but God won't receive your worship because you pick and choose what you will obey. And the way you live on Monday doesn't reflect the songs you sing and the prayers you pray on Sunday. You say you believe in God, but you constantly fight and quarrel with one another. You constantly grumble and complain instead of doing what God is calling you to do. Feeding the hungry, clothing the naked, providing shelter for the homeless. You say you believe in God, but you won't forgive. You continue to harbor bitterness and resentment. You say you believe in God, but you're miserly and stingy with what God has given to you. You say you believe in God, but you rationalize away sin, even though doing so you know is contrary to God's character and to his word. Furthermore, there are things that you cherish far more than your relationship with God. In chapter 5, Isaiah says, your thoughts are consumed with purchasing elaborate homes and having grand parties, but you give no thought to the Lord and the things that break the heart of God. Over in chapter 58, Isaiah says, behind closed doors, you set idols up and you worship someone other than the Lord God. Now, you know, in our contemporary society, we may not physically worship a statue, but we know we have set up an idol in our heart. When we take good things, like our career, our marriage, our family, our looks, our body image, our health and fitness, a romantic relationship or lack thereof, the approval of others, secure and comfortable living, money and possessions, and we turn it into the ultimate thing in our life rather than a close relationship with God. 
believing that these things, instead of the Lord, will give us fulfillment, security, and significance in life. An idol is anything more important to you than God. Anything you look at and say, if I have that, then I'll be content, I'll be fulfilled, I'll be satisfied in life. We can identify idols in our lives by asking ourselves, what is it that I often daydream about having or doing? What do I fear the most in life? What do I dread losing the most in life? What do I worry about? What keeps me up at night? How do I spend my money and my time? Make no mistake, friends, whatever you treasure in your heart, there your money and your time will go. And so here's the thing. If we really want to know whether we have the mark or the seal of Christ or the mark of the Antichrist, there's no better way to know than to examine who and what it is we really worship. It's asking ourselves, is there anything that I'm holding on to? Is there anything where I'm saying, God, you can have all of me, but just just don't mess with this relationship. You can have all of me, but just don't mess with my health or with my children or with my finances or with my need for safety and security. Make no mistake, friends, whatever you hold on to, whatever you can't hold with an open hand is the object of your worship and your affection. And I say an open hand because many things that God gives to us are perfectly okay in themselves. The issue is, can we hold them with an open hand? In other words, are we okay with giving them up or letting them go if God calls us to? If we're not, It's an idol. It's taking the place of God. You know, back in Isaiah chapter 6, he asked the Lord this question, Lord, how long will it be before they are ready to listen? Before your people are ready to turn from their idolatry and set their affections on you. And God replies, and this should be sobering, just listen to this, not until their cities are destroyed and the whole country is an utter wasteland and they are taken away as slaves to other countries far away. Now here's the thing. Out of love for his people, God gave them 20 years after Isaiah warned them to repent and to let go of their idols. He gave them 20 years. He sent Isaiah to warn them again and again, and yet they never did. They never turned from their idols. Satan continued to deceive them, continued to blind them to their foolishness, And they bought it hook, line, and sinker. And 20 years later, God said, okay, have it your way. And he allowed the nation of Assyria to invade and conquer Israel and to take the Israelites away as slaves to various parts of the world. And what they cherished, what they refused to let go of, their idols were destroyed, were lost and left behind. 
But it didn't have to be this way. This was not God's desire for his people. His desire was that they would just hold everything with an open hand and put their trust in him in everything and worship him alone. And make no mistake, this is God's desire for you and me because he knows us better than we know ourselves. He knows that we were made to worship only an audience of one. And that is him and him alone. And mark my word, friends, whatever you hang on to, whatever it is you don't commit to God, be it a relationship, be it your marriage, your family, your finances, whatever it is you worship instead of God will be the area of your greatest frustration, the area of your greatest worry, trouble, and sleepless nights. Sooner or later, every one of us has to make up our minds about whether we're going to trust God and live for God or not. Whether we're going to surrender our life completely to him or not. Whether we're going to take his seal, we're going to take his mark or not. The Bible and testimonies of millions today affirm the fact that God is totally trustworthy and faithful. When you give God his rightful place at the center of your life and you worship him alone rather than all of the temporary idols, when you can say to him, Jesus, you're enough. You're all I need. It is then and only then you'll begin to find victory over the enemy and his attempt to discourage and defeat you. And you're going to discover instead the joy, the peace, the satisfaction that can only be found in Christ and Christ alone. Would you please bow your heads for a moment? I'm going to ask the prayer partners just to make their way up here right now. And as they're coming... I'm just going to leave you with two questions, friends. What's God saying to you? And what is he asking you to do about it? This is between you and him.